be seated. So just kind of getting into this parable here and, um, you know, missionary being here, thinking kind of uh, in that missions context, and you know, we talk about the great commission that's given to the church, you find that in Matthew chapter 28, it's one of those places, and he, he tells us, you know, we are to, says, go ye therefore and teach all nations, you know, in that first part, it's talking about giving them the gospel and then baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. It says, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. So we, that's what we are to do. We're to go out to teach the gospel, to see people get saved, to see them get baptized and added to the church, and then to continue to teach, not to just leave it at that point, but to continue to teach and disciple. And we don't do that alone. You know, back when we think about the Great Commission, you know, it doesn't start with just go ye therefore. It starts with Christ saying, all power is given unto me in heaven and earth. And so we need to realize he has all this power. He's the one sending us out. And then at the end of that, he says, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. And so when we go out, we're not going out alone. And we need to be going out in his power and with uh, doing things in his way. Now with this, with this parable here, you know, we have three different parts of it that we can be looking at. We have the seed, we have the soil, and we have the sower. I don't typically alliterate things, but it's here in the text, so I go with it. All right, the seed, the soil, and the sower. And we're going to kind of look at those. The Starting with the seed, in Matthew here in verse 19 says, when anyone heareth the word of the kingdom. That's the seed that we're talking about here. Here it says the word of the kingdom. If you're over in Luke, it's going to say the word of God. If you're in Mark, it's just going to say here the word. So what are we talking about? What is the seed? It's quite simple. It's right here. It's the word of God. It's the word. And uh, a big part of that is going to be the gospel. But I don't believe that this text is limited to the gospel. It's the word of God. And so with that, uh, looking at verse 19, kind of going through some of this explanation that Christ gave of the parable that he told, uh, we see the seed, this word of God, the word of the kingdom here. But what happens with it when it interacts with these different soils? In verse 19 it says, When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. This is he which received seed by the wayside. So the soil is representing that heart of man, where that seed is being sown. So as that word of God is given to different people, that's gonna, their heart represents these different soils. And as such, you have all these different uh, results depending on where the heart is at. And in this one here, when he talks about that which was sown by the wayside, says that the wicked one, uh, they understand it not, and then cometh the wicked one, catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. Now that wayside, that is that hard, hard ground that's been trodden down, whether it's maybe around the edge of a, a field, or maybe it's around, you know, maybe it's a pathway through the middle, but it's just that hard, trodden down ground that doesn't want to let anything penetrate it. When someone has that type of heart attitude, you see the result that the word of God has on that here, and really there's not a whole lot that happens. It says that he understandeth it not, and cometh the wicked one, and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. Now if we're talking in relation to the gospel specifically, if you have the hard-hearted person, and they say, you know, I don't want to hear it, well, obviously, they're not accepting the gospel, and you, you have someone who is lost. But at the same time, you know, we need to be mindful. How are we hearing the word of God sitting here today? Do we have a hard heart, or are we being receptive to it? In verse 20, it says, But he that received seed into stony places, the same as he that heareth the word, and anon with joy receiveth it. Yet hath he not root in himself, but dureth for a while. For when tribulation or persecution ariseth, because of the word, by and by, he is offended. He's offended when things get hard and he just turns away from it. Now, with 
kind of thinking in the context of when we're giving the gospel to somebody, we, we would see that as somebody who they might hear the word and they might try to apply some of it to their life. But it's not getting to their heart. Notice that there was no root in the heart. If we don't have God's word reach our hearts, well, you still see someone who, even though they might be trying to apply some of these things to their life, it's not in their heart. You still don't see somebody who is saved in relation to the gospel here. In verse 21, says, uh, sorry, verse 22, he also that receives seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word, and the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and then notice the last phrase here, he becometh unfruitful. Well, to become unfruitful, you have to be on that path of becoming fruitful. We go from one to the other. And so we have somebody, and again, with the gospel, they would have received the gospel, they've accepted Christ, they could become fruitful. Yet, the deceitfulness of riches, the cares of this world, they choke that, and they become unfruitful. Now, I've seen this happen a lot of times. Uh, after I had graduated from Bible college, I worked at a church in Alabama. I was working with a, um, a Christian school there and as a youth director during that time. And I uh, would have, you know, especially when you go to camp and things, you see people making decisions for the Lord. These young people and some of them getting saved. And then we go back home. Then things start to change. A lot of the opposition they received Sometimes came from their own home. And then you start having all these different things coming towards them that are starting to choke out that word. Maybe you see a young person get saved, and then next thing you know, they, they want to go get this job. Well, that job makes them work on Wednesday nights. And then starts to pull them away. Maybe they need to get this car. Well, to have a car, they have to have a job, and to have a job, well, then, you know, there's all this circular reasoning. I've seen it multiple times, and it always had the same result. Those cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choked out the word of God in their life, and they became unfruitful, just like the scripture says. But it's not just with young people. I've seen this with older people as well, people chasing a job and these different things, and they put uh, staying in a good church and following God, they put that secondary to these things, and they become unfruitful. Then verse 23 says, But he that received seed into the good ground is he that heareth the word and understandeth it, which also beareth fruit and bringeth forth, some in a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Now, all of us in here should have a desire that we would have a heart, that is this good ground, that is receptive to the word of God, that's going to be a, a good soil for the word of God to grow and become fruitful in. And as we go out, we try to be a witness to others. That's the type of people we hope to run into, to find these people who will be receptive and they will grow in the Lord. Now when you get to, uh, when you get to see that happen, it does something good for your heart and your soul to see you know someone that you witness to and later on down the road they they get involved and they become fruitful themselves and i could think of some people that we reach uh back in kansas city through vacation bible school back in you know, been 2009 2010 and now those that started coming to vacation bible school now there's uh, one young lady she married another man in the church and they're running our wednesday night youth program there's uh, another young man is involved with the youth ministry as well. And we hope that we'll find those people when we go out and teach the word of God and to try to spread the gospel. But we don't know. We don't know where their heart is at when we go out. We just know that the word of God is going to have some type of effect on their life. But we don't know what it's going to be. And so... We also want to make sure that our heart is in the right place uh, with this as well. The seed being the word of God and the soil being our hearts. But then we also have the sower. And I really started to wonder, you know, we, we sometimes hear this text and we, I started to think about it. I was like, why do we always call this the parable of the sower? And there's so much emphasis on the 
uh, soil that Christ gives us here. And I asked myself, the question, why are we even calling it the parable of the sower? And then I felt a little silly when I realized the answer in verse number 18 when Christ said, Hear ye therefore the parable of the sower. We call it that because Christ did. And so I really wanted to kind of look at this text and say, well, what can I learn about the sower? If Christ is going to call it the parable of the sower, what can we learn about him? And as I looked through the explanation that Christ gives uh, here in Matthew 13 to learn more about the sower, I didn't see anything. There wasn't any more information about the sower here. Now over in, uh, in Mark, it does say one thing about the sower. It says that the sower soweth the word. So at least we know what the sower is doing. The sower is sowing the word. But if you go back to the beginning of the parable in verse number 3, I want to notice a couple things about the sower, and I think that will help us out here. In verse 3, Christ starts the parable in the last half of the verse. It says, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. He is a sower. He's going out to do his job. Okay, simple enough. In verse 4, it says, When he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside. In verse 5, it says, Some fell upon stony places. And then in verse 7, it says, Some fell among thorns. And in verse 8, it says, But other fell into good ground. And so all we really know about the sower is he went out to sow. And as he's sowing, the seed is falling in all these varied places. And so I tried to really think about this and put myself in that situation. And, you know, I think when we put ourselves in those situations, even like just with our, our missions video, if you really try to put yourself in the situation that these other people are in, I think you learn a lot more from it than when you're just listening to it. And the same thing with the parable here, trying to picture what Christ is giving us. And so you have the sower, he's going out to sow this field. And we used to live down in Alabama. And one of the things I like down there is everything grows all the time. It's growing almost all year long. I would talk about the seasons we had. We had two seasons down there. We had summer and we had January. And so stuff grew all the time, and I loved it. I loved to watch these things grow. And you know, I had some raised garden beds and things, and I realized that's not going to help me understand this parable because he wasn't sowing in raised garden beds. The sower here, he'd be sowing a, a much larger field, and as such, he would often have this uh, you know, bag of seed, and you reach into that bag of seed, and you start casting it out into your field. And as you cast that out, that seed might start to go in some unintended places. But as I really thought about it, you know, we see multiple accounts in, in the Bible how they would take oxen and they would plow these fields first. They would prepare these fields. And so with that, that mindset of, okay, this man holding this bag of seed and going out and sowing this field... I could see, you know, seed falling around the, the wayside. But if that field was previously prepared, why is all the seed going around the thorns? Why is it going around the stony places? It's more like this, this sower is going out. And he's not throwing seed into this prepared field that he has here. It's more like he's just going out. And wherever he goes, he's just throwing that seed out there. Everywhere. Throwing seed. He's not caring about where that seed is going. He's throwing the seed out. He's just sowing and sowing everywhere. And then I, I realized, well, that's how we're supposed to be with the gospel. We go out, we sow it everywhere. We don't try to look for this prepared field of all this good ground because we cannot judge the hearts of men. Only God knows what's in somebody's heart. But a lot of times, I think we try to do that. And we try to say, oh, this person over here, they, they look like they're going to be that hard ground. I'm going to go talk to this person instead, rather than just sowing the seed everywhere, sowing the word of God everywhere we go. We make, we make a lot of excuses because a lot of times we make it, I think, more about ourselves than about the word of God. You know, Christ didn't give any extra details on the sower in his explanation because it's not about the sower. It's not about the sower at all. It's about the seed. It's about the word of God and the work that the word of God can do in the hearts of men. And, but a lot of times we make it about ourselves as the sower. And we, not in 
I mean, there's no good way, but not in a way where like, oh, look how many seed I'm going to sow today, but usually more in the sense of, oh, I, I, I don't know that I can do that right now. Or you know, maybe this is just not a good time for me to talk to that person. Or, like I said, judging the hearts of men and saying, you know, that, that person's probably going to be the hard ground. I'm, I'm not going to uh, bother with that right now. And we make excuses on why it's not a good time to share the gospel or to sow that seed. And so with that, you know, I'm, I'm, not, a, I'm not immune from that. I've, I've been there. I've done that. And again, just to kind of help understand what I'm talking about, I'm going to give you a, a perfect example of a time that I've done that. Well, why would I, why would I do that? Someone's going to make myself look bad. Well, because I don't, it's not about making myself look good. It's about telling you how good God is. And so there was a time where we're down in Alabama working with the youth group, and we were taking them to camp for the summer. And you load up everybody in that 15-passenger van, and you start out traveling down the road. Eventually, and you stop for gas. So we're at a gas station, and while we're there, I pull up to the pump, and I open up my door, and you just hear this loud music coming from the vehicle on the other side of the pump. It's this big U-Haul truck, and this music I never would have expected is like this heavy metal mixed with bagpipes, and it was just it was a little odd, and so it kind of caught me off guard a little bit, and so I'm just getting my gas, and then I look up. And I notice out of the gas station, the, the doors open up, and there's this, this man that starts walking out. And I could tell from a distance, this is, this is a big, in like every way imaginable, a very large man that starts walking out. And then I notice as he's walking out, he's walking to this truck on the other side of the pump next to me. And as he, as he gets closer, he's just getting bigger and bigger. And I start to feel intimidated just looking at him. And he looks kind of rough. And he's just massive, and I'm intimidated. And so my thought is, I need to finish pumping gas and just get out of here before I get hurt. I had no reason to think of him that way. He hadn't done anything, but I, I, I did. And so I was, I was finished getting my gas, and I was ready to get in the van and go. And then God started knocking on my heart and said, no. No, you go talk to that man. Shame on me for not doing that already. Because I was being very judgmental towards him, thinking, oh, there's some hard ground. Oh, this might not be a good situation to witness to him. But by the grace of God, God had other plans. And so I went over and, well, before I went over, I had to stop and think to myself, again, I'm still very intimidated, and I feel like he could just go like this and squash me like a bug. And picture like a massive Viking just without the helmet. That was this man. So I had to get to the point within myself where I said, if I die, my wife can drive the kids back home. L again, I, literally, I did. I had to get to that point and said, okay, Lord, this is what you want me to do. I'll do it. So I go and I go talk to this man. This man said several things that really caught me off guard. Number one, you know, I was started trying to tell him about Christ, and he told me the God that he believed in was Thor. How many of you have met somebody who believes in Thor? A couple of y'all. Not too many, though. That was by far the first, and then it made more sense why he looked like a Viking, because that was his heritage, and he told me all about that. And so, But then what really got me was I said, you know, he believed in Thor, but he's really starting to believe that it was this Jesus Christ that was the real God and that Jesus kept reaching out to him. Because I wasn't the first one who gave him a track and tried to witness to him. I was probably about the fourth one in the last week or two, he had said. And so he believed that Christ was trying to say something to him. So he was very receptive. And he didn't get saved in that moment. I don't know if he did later on or not. But here's this man who's ready to hear the word of God. And then there's me shying away from telling him just because he looked a little rough on the outside. But how often do we do that where we look on the outside of the person and we don't see through to the soul? You know, the Bible tells us that God is not willing that any should perish. Why are we? We hold back because of you know, whatever 
we're fearful of the situation or whatever it may be, again, making it about ourselves in that moment, why are we willing that they would perish if we don't give them that opportunity to receive the gospel? Now, again, we can make all kinds of excuses, and it's different for different people, or you say, oh, well, you know, I just, I don't have things right in my life at the moment, and, and by all means, I'm not saying that we should not strive to live a sanctified life for the Lord, a practically sanctified life. But even if we have some things that aren't quite right yet, that's not an excuse for not giving somebody the gospel. All right? So as another e- example, there was a, uh, not personal for me necessarily, but there was a, a young lady and her daughter that were walking down the road one night when their car broke down. There was a man who pulled up next to them and asked them if they needed a ride. This young lady never would have normally accepted the ride, but she did. For whatever reason that night, she did. And the car was dirty and kind of trashed out and smelled like smoke. But she got it anyways because she was really in a hard spot. And so this man, he did exactly what he said. He drove her home. The young girl got out and went inside, and then that man continued to talk to the young lady, and he began to witness to her, and she got saved. That was my mother-in-law, led to the Lord by this man. You know, he didn't have all of his stuff together, obviously, which, you know, just from some of the things that were in his car, but I'm glad that he didn't use that as an excuse not to share the gospel. Since she got saved later on, my, my wife got saved, and uh, she has a s- sister, maybe two that have gotten saved. Then uh, my mother-in-law, her, she was able to lead her father to the Lord, which was a Czech man. You know, we're going to the Czech Republic. So this man with the dirty car, just because he chose to share the gospel with somebody, now there's all these other people down the road that are coming to Christ. And so with my, my wife's grandfather that got saved, He didn't get saved until he was 94 years old. And he passed away the next year at 95. But in that last year of his life, he still led his wife to the Lord. So there was a German lady that got saved. The Gospels reach a people from all these different places because of this one guy in a dirty car that shared the Gospel with somebody. We don't have any good excuses on why we should not go out and share the gospel, why we should not go out and sow that seed, but a lot of times we make them because we make make it about ourselves when it's not about us at all. It's about the seed and getting it to the hearts of man. And when we think about, oh, well, it's going to be hard ground. Well, how's that ground going to get broken up if we don't put some seed in it? Do you know, like, even in uh, farming, they use seeds, like radishes and stuff, to break up hard ground. As we continue to sow the seed into the hearts, God can use his word to soften that ground. But if we say, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to because it's, it's, it's not going to be easy, well, shame on us. And again, I don't, it's not just about the gospel, but it's about all of the word of God and giving it to others around us. Think about situations even within the church. Uh, another example, there's a, a young lady who got saved, and she felt like an outsider in many ways. Her parents weren't going to the church. Uh, she was driving herself, and you know, she didn't really fit in with a lot of people. There's a lot of kind of cliques and stuff with the teenagers, and she just didn't feel like she fit in. And at home, the worship of education was being pushed on her, and she was feeling that draw of the world. And she easily could have become like the thorny ground where those thorns sprung up and choked the word and became unfruitful. But there was a man in her church who said, I'm going to sow the word of God into her. Now, this man, he came from a hard background. He, you know, 
had uh, all the tattoos and stuff in areas where you can't cover them up. So he felt you know, somewhat self-conscious about that, I would imagine. Uh, many people do, but I mean, ultimately that's, that's the past. Uh, you know, God is not going to judge us for those things if we come to him. We don't need to necessarily be ashamed of those things. We need to be ashamed of what we're not doing now for serving the Lord. But this man, he didn't let that hold him back. He didn't, even after he had gotten saved, he was not a good example to his family. He lost his wife. He lost his children. He could have easily said, I've messed up so bad, there's no way I could do anything for someone else. In some senses, he did get to that point. But he realized that God still can make a difference. So he saw this young lady, and he made a point of, whenever she was at church, to challenge her, to say just th simple things like, what are you reading in your Bible lately? Or to tell her what he's been studying, saying, hey, study this out, next week we'll talk about it. And through that, this young lady developed a, a love for the word of God through the challenge of this man in the church who was sowing the word of God into her. So instead of becoming like the thorny ground, she became the good ground. She's sitting right there. That's my wife. We need to do our part to sow the word of God into others. It doesn't matter where they are. It doesn't matter if they're outside of this building or inside of this building. You don't know what kind of difference that's going to make. We don't know what kind of ground it's going into. But if you're saved, you know what kind of difference the word of God has made in your life. I know what kind of difference it's made in my life. Why would we want to hold that in and keep it to ourselves? We need to be sowing the word of God. We need to spread it everywhere and not make it about ourselves. It's about him and what he can do. So let's just be faithful to sow the word. Good. Stand with me. We'll pray. And then after I pray, we'll have uh, your pastor come. Our Heavenly Father, we come to you tonight, dear God, and just want to thank you for your word. Thank you for the way that you've used it in my life, for uh, no doubt many, if not all the people here tonight, dear God. I pray that you would help us, Lord, to continue to have that heart that is sensitive to your word, that's allowing your word to grow in our hearts, and that we not be hardened against it, dear God. And Lord, that we would be faithful to just do that which you've given us to do, to sow the word to those outside the church, to those inside the church, to be an encouragement to them, dear God, with your word, so that you can do a great work in us and through us, O oh God. Pray that you would use us all. In Jesus' name, amen.